Wayne, you're going to be my hand writer tonight. Open your Bibles to Ephesians 6. We're going to talk about the shield of faith tonight. Um, we've got just a few more lessons in uh, the spiritual armor, and then uh, we'll go back to the uh, book of Acts to work on it for a while. But tonight we're going to be looking at the shield of faith, and I've got a PowerPoint to uh, share with you to just do something a little different tonight. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16 It says there, above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You got it for me, John? Or are you working on it? There it is. Okay. Go to the next slide for me, please. I want you to notice these shields, the shield, Roman soldier's shield was about two feet by four feet. It was made out of wood, and it said, welcome, on the front of it. <laughs> and uh, they were covered with leather. And uh, oftentimes when they went into battle, um, they would put water on the, uh, wet the leather or uh, the covering of it. And why would they do that? Why do you think that they would do that? According to the verse that we just read. Well, it makes it harder to cut, but what does it say? That we might quench the fiery what? Darts of the devil. Um, the devil uses the shoot at us, and so this shield was the key to the soldier's defense, especially to protect them from the fiery darts. And the other thing that was very interesting about them and about the shield was the fact that they were trimmed in brass and they had a, a little device on the edges of them and they could interlock with the other shields. And um, you show those things there, I forgot that I had them phased like that but they could interlock and they could they could call it, create what they call a phalanx and the interesting thing was that they could do three across and then they could come down the side and then they, behind them they could hook them together overhead and they literally would be like a turtle or something and they could protect themselves and and they were pretty uh, formidable when they were working together uh, against an enemy with uh, using the shields uh, as they're described. All right, next one. Okay, go ahead. They protect them from the fiery darts. You've watched some of the movies of the old uh, uh, Roman wars and um, what was that guy's name? Uh, the Scottish guy that, what? Mel Gibson, yeah. What was the name of that guy he played? Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Braveheart. Grave, uh, thank you. Braveheart. And if you watch that movie and, and they got the uh, Englishman and they all those uh, uh, archers and they're shooting their bows and arrows across or arrows across and some of them were where they would set them on fire. And uh, so you, you get that concept here that the devil's all the time shooting, and I, I've got something I want to share with you because it's really, this was really significant to me and, and spoke to me, and I'll share you why in just a minute. Uh, show the next slide. <laughs> Our computer operator shaking his head. That's not a good sign. Why would Satan show, throw fiery darts at us? What is he trying to do? What? Defeat us. If he can't defeat us, what can he do? He can wound us. He can hurt us. He can distract us. I mean, even if they don't even hit you, if they're coming at you, it can alarm you. 
It can distract your attention from what you need to be thinking about and what you need to be doing. Um, and so we need this protection to deal, this, this shield of faith, and sometimes it's just to destroy us, sometimes it's just to take advantage of us. So here's a question. Why would God allow that? Why doesn't God just stop him? Okay, it can. It can make us stronger. Exactly right. It teaches us dependence on him. We are definitely not in heaven yet. I watched the news and it was we're not heaven yet. Let me show you a verse of scripture. Look over in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. It says, welcome. No. All right, 1 Peter 1 and verse 6. This, this is the scripture for the, the reason why. It says, wherein you greatly rejoice. What, what are we rejoicing in? Well, verse 5 says, who, but, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We're looking forward to it, aren't we? This salvation is not the, the salvation position. It's the salvation from this world. It's the salvation from the penalty of sin. It's the salvation from this uh, sin nature that we have, that ultimate salvation when we get to be with God. He says, we, we greatly rejoice, though now, for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. And the word temptation is better the word trial or test rather than temptation. What's a temptation? Somebody tell me what temptation is. What is a temptation? Well, I don't know if you can't resist it. It's hard to resist sometimes. You, you, you want something you can't have. <laughs> temptation is simply this. It's a solicitation, a, 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 a enticement to have something that is legitimate, but to get it outside of the will of God. It is, do we all need to eat? And we've all doing that fine. I can see. Now, okay. But... But here's the temptation. The temptation isn't to eat. The temptation is to do what? Overeat. You just had a nice meal and you go by Dairy Queen and Tim makes you go in and get him my ice cream. I mean, you know. And you yield to temptation. It's a solicitation. To, just a minute, Don. It's a solicitation to do a good thing in the wrong way. To satisfy a legitimate need outside of the will of God. He says... So this isn't temptation he's talking about here, even though the King James translated it that way. He says, this is a trial. We have different kinds of trial. Manifold means different kinds. If you can imagine, my grandma, um, uh, she used to sew and, and make quilts. And I'm sure some of you ladies have as well. And, and, and the thing was that she would just save all of these kind of scraps of different clothes and things that she would cut out a piece of and I've seen some beautiful uh, quilts that are made with, you know, flowers and baskets and all different kinds of things. But Grandma's was just, a, just a, all kinds of different pieces. There was no pattern to it, or it, it was just a whole variation of colors and textures and, and, and prints. And I want you to keep that in mind. And he said, that's the way that these trials come. They just come from different directions and different ways. And he said, we are faced for a time with these manifold trials or tests that the trying of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And I've shared this with you before. I think we forget in this day that we live we get to thinking that God's purpose for us, his goal for us is to be happy. That is not God's primary goal for you or me. 
What's his goal? To be what? Holy. He wants us to be holy. He wants us to be like his son, Jesus. And he wants our strength, our faith to be strong. And you walk by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the key. Without anything that's not a faith is sin, the Bible says. So his, his primary curriculum for you and me as a believer is to build up our faith. Guess what this shield is called? The shield of faith. So the devil's chunking these fiery darts at us to try to destroy us, but God allows it not to destroy us, but for us to grow and to build up our faith and to grow stronger in faith. Now, Don, I'm sorry, I wanted to cover that before I... Yes. Mm-hmm. No. Mm-hmm. Amen. Sure. And we'll look at that more in just a second, but you're absolutely correct. And a lot of people don't understand that. It is not a sin to be tempted. Jesus was tempted, but he didn't sin. Temptation is simply a solicitation. It is a, and God never tempts anybody. Do you know that? He never tempts you. Only Satan will tempt you. It's a solicitation. The sin comes when you satisfy that, when you yield to it, when you, when you say, okay, yeah, I want that. Just like Eve in the garden when Satan said, you know, he knows that if you take that fruit and eat it, that you're going to be like God and you will have the knowledge of good and evil and, and all of those things. Was it sin then? No. When did it become sin? She picked it and took a bite. And so he says here, Satan's trying to tempt you to do wrong, to evil, to satisfy something good out of something that in a way that's un, uh, outside of God's will. But it's not sin until you satisfy that, until you take that step. But God is testing us. He's trying us. And he's, he let Satan use those things to test us and to try us so that our faith grows stronger and we become powerful and mighty in the faith. Now, I want you to notice there that uh, it protects but you didn't carry the shield with you all the time. Why? What? It was heavy. That's one reason. What? You didn't need it everywhere because you wasn't fighting all the time. And, uh, but you need to be ready to take it up. And it's something that you have to take up. That's what he says. You need to take up the shield and uh, be prepared to use it. All right, let's talk about some of these uh, fiery darts for just a minute. The fiery darts of the devil. And here, um, here's the verse. Look over at chapter 4 of 1 Peter and uh, verse um, 12. And, and this, this is the thing that's so interesting to me. And it tells me something about uh, believers today. If you have uh, cable or if you have satellite TV, uh, very likely that you have a number of religious programs and, and, and channels uh, on those different outlets. And I would be fairly confident in saying that at any general time, if you flip through those channels, you could find somebody preaching what I call the prosperity gospel. You know, um, if you had enough faith, you, you, you know, God's going to give you all the money you need. You don't ever be poor. And God's always going to give you uh, good health. You'll never be sick. And, um, and then on and on. But the, in, uh, the, the uh, inference is that if you 
don't have enough money and you don't and you are unhealthy what's your problem you don't have enough what faith and the idea that they convey is that if you are having trouble in your life if you are having difficulties and trials it's because of your lack of faith that if you have good faith if you have strong faith you won't have any trials is that true no Absolutely not. Here's what Peter says, verse 12. Think it not strange. Don't consider it a strange, unique, unusual, out of the ordinary thing. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Instead, what are you to do? Rejoice in that you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you're reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. He's telling us, hey, this is part of the curriculum of being a Christian. I know we've all sung this song. I remember when I was a kid growing up in church, it was the standard song we sang for invitation. Can anybody guess what it was? Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come. And I just knew when I was 10 years old that it had 100 verses because it sounded like we sang all hundred of them every Sunday, you know. The preacher just keep on singing until somebody came, whether they wanted to or not. They just come to get him shut up. But, yeah. <laughs> he says, look, you just come and get right with the Lord and God to take care of you. And he's telling us here, he said, this is part of the fire drill, I call it. Peter says, because it's going to be part of your Christian life if, if you're walking with the Lord. What worries me is not when people say, man, I'm, I'm getting really tested. That doesn't worry me. What worries me is when people say, hey, I don't have any problems at all. Everything's going really great. Buckle up. If you're a Christian, buckle up. Something's going to happen. Because listen, God loves you just as, he, you, just as you are. But he loves you too much to leave you that way. He wants to keep you growing and maturing. All of us who have par our parents here tonight, you know, our ki kids are cute, you know, and sweet when they're little. And, they, and sometimes you just like for them to stay a certain age. And then some of us are praying, move on, Lord, move them on. We want our children to grow, right? We want them to develop and mature and, and use what God put them here for. God wants you to do the same thing. And he uses this process here of, of, um, of fiery darts. Let's see the next one, John. We've got you locked up again. Okay, that's all right. Do the best you can, brother. Now, the reason that uh, I, I mentioned about... Um, Temptation is one of the key ones that Satan uses as temptation for the Christian. He said, I can't keep you out of heaven, but boy, I can sure try to mess you up in your walk. I can get you to go where you shouldn't go and do what you shouldn't do and act in a way that you shouldn't act. Keep going if you can. Um, there you go. There's what we want. Temptation. Um, back sometime earlier this year, I was preaching about Abraham. And if you remember, after Abraham went out and rescued Lot and he defeated the, the, the kings that had uh, came, uh, come against uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and those guys, and he got all the loot and he brought it back and he got the people back and everything. And he went to the king of Sodom and he said, here's your stuff back. And he said, no, 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 you just give us the people and you can keep all of the stuff. Now, what was the temptation? 
the temptation was wealth. Now, he wasn't a poor man. I don't want you to get the idea. He was a, he was a wealthy man, but this was not a little bit of money. I mean, he had, this king had defeated five nations, and he had taken the good stuff. He had taken their servants. He would taken their money. He had taken their cattle. He would taken every. I mean, he had really vanquished these people. And so to be able to say you keep everything but the people was a tremendous, tremendous amount of temptation because, wow, I mean, I'm set now. But notice if you want to, want to or I'll, I'll read it to you. In Genesis 15, I like what he says. He answers the king of Sodom. And here's what he says. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. He said, I'll take care of you. You don't need to shortcut this thing. I will take care of you. Do you believe God will take care of you? Well, why do we play the lottery then? Huh? Uh, huh? Well, we don't. Well, there are plenty of Christians that do, and I'm not, I'm not jumping on anybody for playing the lottery, but the point is, when you play the lottery, what are you trying to do? Get rich when? Quick, quickly, apart from having to work. If God wants to prosper you, he will, and he can, and he's prospered many Christians. But guess what God's plan is for most of us? We get up and go to work, and we come home to our families, and there's even something, and there's a whole other lesson there, but there's something in there about this issue of the benefit of work and the blessing of doing work, and, and we get a reward or our earn from that. So the first, the first is the temptation, a solicitation to do evil, not sin, not sin to be tempted. Only can sin when we, what? Yield to it. So how do we deal with it? We take up that shield of faith that says, I'm going to trust God. This is what God says I shouldn't do. This is what God says I should do. And this is one of those things I shouldn't do. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to say no. I'm not going to go that direction. I'm not going to yet do that. I'm going to keep on going by Dairy Queen. I'm not going to turn in. And I just use that as an illustration. I love Dairy Queen too. So, But the point is, how do we resist temptation? Do we just do it by gritting our teeth and just hoping that we can say no? Well, I'm going to tell you, you try that and it's probably going to get whooped. You'll probably get tripped up somewhere. But you pick up that shield of faith that says, I believe that God's way is the best way. Um, We've got some friends, and they've got a son. His uh, Their son graduated from college this year, and uh, he's got him a little girlfriend, and he's got a job down in Myrtle Beach, and her dad's a pastor down there. And I expect any day, as soon as he gets a few paychecks, that they're going to go buy a ring. They decided when they started dating that they would not hold hands, they wouldn't hug, and they won't kiss until they get married. Guess what? They're safe. <laughs> they don't have to worry about being on a dark road someplace and things getting out of hand. They just play it safe. And they're not trying to rub it in anybody's face or be unkind or, you know, be prudish. They want, when they stand at the altar that day, they want to be pure to each other and to God. It's taking up the shield of faith. So, Temptation is an issue. Next one. Evil thoughts. And this was the one that really the Lord got after me. I want you to go over to 1 Kings 19. Because this one's the one that really, I mean, whew, I had to stop and park here a while. First Kings 19, we have Elijah. Elijah has, has challenged the uh, prophets of Baal 
and King Ahab and Jezebel. He's had a great confrontation where the prophets of Baal and the altar was all consumed and all that, and God is answered by fire, and, uh, and he's running, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Well, Jezebel, the queen, puts out an uh, a, a edict that says, you know what you did to my prophets? Well, I'm going to do that to you by tomorrow. I'm going to kill you. We'll wipe you out. And he takes off and he runs literally miles and miles and miles to get away. And he ends up out in the wilderness underneath a tree. And um, verse, nine, or verse 1, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me. By the way, notice the word gods. What's the unique about it? It's little g. Not our God, the little gods, the pagan gods. And more also, if I make not thy life as one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw it, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. And he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might do what? Die. And he said, Lord, it's enough. Take my life away. For I'm not better than my father. Said he lay and he slept under a juniper tree. Behold, there an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. But here's the point that I want you to see. And boy, I'm telling you what, the devil is so good at this. You ever been reading your Bible? I mean, or you're trying to pray and the nastiest thoughts jump into your mind? Or you look at somebody that you know for years and, and they're a good person and all of a sudden evil things start jumping into your mind and you, I don't know about you, but, it, and I feel oppressed and I say, wait a minute, where did that come from? I don't feel that way about them. I don't talk like that. I don't think those things. And, and all of a sudden they just, your just mind is bombarded. This is what we're talking about. And he's great at this. He is so good. Or all of a sudden, nasty things will be ready to come out of your mouth. Down in Miami, where I worked after Bible college, my home church, um, after the founding pastor, Dr. Aljani, retired, they hired a man, uh, Brother Robinson, or Robertson, A.G. Robertson was his name. And he was there for probably 15 years preaching. Great man, great preacher. He and his wife, the last account that I had, both of them have Alzheimer's. They are in a, uh, a share room in a nursing home in uh, Virginia Beach. He recognizes no one, knows no one. And if you go in to see him, he'll tell you a dirty joke. You say, he preached all those years and he's telling dirty jokes. Why? because our heart is depraved, folks. And you take away the restraint of our spirit and the restraint of our minds and no telling what will come out of our mouth. This is what he's talking about here. How do you deal with that? And why would you deal with that? Let me just tell you why this hit me so hard and why the Holy Spirit just spoke to me. I, I, have, been, I have been battling this issue um, of unworthiness. Um, I, I am so grateful to be your pastor. I'm grateful, and, and your folks have been so kind and so gracious, but I'll tell you what, I get through preaching, and I get in my car to go home, and I'm attacked. Do you know how lousy you did today? That was the sorriest sermon that anybody could ever preach. How could you stand in front of those people? And I get this all the way home. I wake up in the middle of the night, and I'll just be blasted with these thoughts. You need to go to church. I'm not kidding you. Several times I thought about coming to church and turning in my resignation. I just felt so unworthy, so inferior. And I couldn't understand where it was coming from. There's where it's coming from, right there. That's where it's coming from. 
And when I was listening to this and studying this, and, and I've taught this before, and I thought, wow. If God called me, I'm his man. I do what he tells me to do. And he makes it right, not me. And it's changed my attitude. It changed my attitude. Not that I you know, think of anybody special, but listen, God called me here. God called me to do what I'm doing, and I'm going to share it with you to the best of my ability, and the rest in God's hands, not mine. But boy, I'm telling you, I don't know if anybody even knew, but I had just struggled with that for some time now, several times. And boy, when I got to this thing, evil thoughts, vile words, boy, it just hit me, and the Holy Spirit said, that's what you're doing. You need to get the shield of faith, and the faith says, I belong to him. He gifted me, he called me. And if, if he put me here, he'll enable me to stay here and do. Yeah, boy. Do you think that you're just about, like, are you reading evil thoughts even though it influences Satan? Sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, I know we can't be possessed with demons, but no. you can share enough influence. It's like, like yours, and I've had it happen to me before reading the Bible, and all of a sudden, just do your thing. I mean, <laughs> sure. Or trying to pray. And you're trying to pray, and you're trying to be serious with God and pray for people. And what happens? Oh, I forgot to put this on my grocery list. You know, oh, I forgot to call that guy. I mean, really? You th- where does that come from? It doesn't come from the Lord. It's the enemy. That's why they've been buying my tapes, brothers, to do that. I know. Oh, I understand. I do. Okay, that's number two. Number three. Let's see the next slide. Start over. Oh, we're going good here. Doubt. Wow. You ever doubt God? Sure you do. You know? Um, and here's more of the same, just in a different format than what I was talking about. And, um, you know, God, why me? And he just, the enemy just blasts your mind because you see, guess what happens? If he's shooting these darts at you and you don't have the shield of faith, up, what do you get? You're, you're off balance. You can't be effective as a soldier for Christ. You're, you're not prepared to, to be effective as a testimony, a witness. I mean, I, I thank Ellen for his, her sharing tonight. You know, you've got to take up that shield of faith. I've, folks, in and of ourselves, we are what? Nothing. We're just a bunch of clay pots. But thank God, God puts his glory in the clay pots. We just make ourselves available. It's like, here I am. Enemy's going to say, you're not worthy. You're saying, I'm right. I'm not, you're right. I'm not worthy. But I, it's not because of my worthiness that I can do anything. It's because of his worthiness. It's not because of my power. It's not because of my knowledge. I know Dave keeps saying, I keep wondering, where in the world are you getting all that stuff out of the scripture? Uh, it's not because of me. Uh, I, I don't have any great education or training. I just pray and study and ask God to show me. And, and if, if, it, if something comes from it, it's him. But he, he bombards us with all of this. And this is one of the reasons we talked about before, the, the idea of establishing our feet in the truth and putting on the belt of truth and putting on the breastplate of righteousness. We need to be established in truth, folks, because if you listen to your heart, what's going to happen? You're in trouble. Next slide. Here's these three boys, Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the king says, if you don't bow down, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace and you'll die. And they said, that's okay. God may save us from the fire, he may save us through the fire, or he may not save us at all, but here's the bottom line, we're not going to bow. But don't you think, before they said that, that the enemy was whispering in their ear, how would you like that, boys, that thing's going to send you, burn you, oh, it's going to be bad. Sure, it was going through their head, but they shielded the faith and said, we're going to trust God. One of my favorite Old Testament books, and a lot of people don't even know about it or haven't read it, but the book of Habakkuk. He was so confused over what God was wanting to do. 
He said, how in the world, God, can you take a nation that's more wicked than your people and use them to judge your people? How, God, that doesn't make sense. And God says, well, let me just explain it to you. He said, okay. And he gets up on his tower and he waits, and God doesn't explain it to him. But here's what Habakkuk said. God, if the whole world's turned upside down, if everything that I know to be truth turns out to be untrue, I'm going to trust you. And that's what God wants us to do. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 18, great verse. Everything may be upside down, but I want to trust God. That's the shield of faith. That's why Hebrews writes, it is without faith it is impossible to please God. For you must believe that he is God and that he is a rewarder of those that hold up the shield of faith. And he will reward you. Go ahead, next one. Here's some of the examples of fiery darts. Doubt your salvation. You need to get a, you need to check out that new secretary at work. Boy, she's a lot better looking than your wife. I bet she'd be nicer to you than and you need to get out of your marriage. And it could go either way. I think this is one of the reasons why we have the, the rate of divorce that we have today. So you mow it, <laughs> yeah, and you have to mow it more often. Uh, here's one, and I, this happened to me uh, last year. I was preparing messages like I've been doing, and I'm reading the scriptures, and all of a sudden, Mel, how do you know that this is true? You're taking an awful lot by faith. This is an old book. And, and how do you know that it's real? What, what if you get to the end of your life and, and, and you put all this time and effort and, and sharing the scriptures, studying the scriptures, and, and you, know, you could have had a job somewhere making a lot of money, and, and, and I'm going, where does this come from? There's where it comes from. How do you know God's real? That's the enemy. That's the fiery darts. How do I know that it's real, folks? There you go, right here. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Having evil thoughts and words pop in your mind in the middle of praying. And they seem to rise from our own heart. But they don't come from your heart, folks. Where do they come from? The enemy. He's trying to attack us because we're in a warfare. All right, next one. Okay. Now, here's a good one. What is the difference between believing and faith? Because I've had people say, I believe in God. I believe the Bible. I believe in Jesus, the Son of God. I believe he died on the cross for our sins. I believe he rose from the dead. But they're not going to heaven. What's the difference between belief and faith? Well, the devil, the devil believes. Mm-hmm. It requires a commitment of trust. And uh, one of my favorite uh, illustrations is, is the story of the tightrope walker over Niagara Falls. And I've shared it with the church before, but I'll just give you the Reader's Digest version real quick. And uh, back, back in the 1800s, they, they literally stretched a cable across Niagara Falls. A circus performer, a tightrope walker, he advertised that he was going to walk across the Niagara Falls. And they sold tickets, and people gathered, and everybody was excited. And he took his big, long pole, got up on there, and walked across the falls and back. Oh, everybody cheered. And then he took and he walked across without the pole, and everybody cheered. And then he rode a bicycle, literally, across the cable, and everybody cheered. Then he took a wheelbarrow with a 100-pound sack of potatoes in it, and he pushed it backwards and forwards. Everybody cheered. After he did that, he got out off the wire and he walked up to a man standing there and he said to him, do you believe that I could put a man in this wheelbarrow and push him across the falls safely and bring him back? And the man said, absolutely. I saw you do it. I believe you could do it. He said, get in. 
You see, the difference between belief and faith is that he believed it, but he wasn't willing to put his faith in it. And here's where the shield of faith comes. We can believe it in our heads, but unless we act on it and trust to it and commit to it, then that shield can't protect us. Okay, next one. How do we strengthen our faith? I want to give you three things real quickly here. Strengthen our faith. The key number one is we need to trust God's character. If you doubt that God is loving, if you doubt that God is faithful, if you doubt that God is in control, if you doubt that God is good, then what do you do? You're, you're troubled. You have no foundation to stand on. You begin to question, well, you listen, you know, this person died and they were only so old and they shouldn't have died or this person's sick or a little boy like we know has got cancer. Is God good? Yes, God's still good and he's still God and he's still in control. It requires us trusting God's character. That's what Habakkuk did. Um, that's the verse there. It says, yea, I will rejoice in the Lord I will joy in the God of my salvation. I don't understand everything. I don't know what he's doing. I don't understand how he's doing it, but I want to trust in who he is. And folks, that's why we need to study the scriptures, and, and we'll see that in a minute, so that we understand who God is. Too many people don't understand who God is. They have a, a, a elementary concept of him, but that elementary concept doesn't stand up too good when you get in intensive battle. You need to really, that's why the Psalms are amazing when it comes to understanding who God is and his nature and his character. All right, next one. We need to trust God's promises. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? We need to trust in what God said. Titus chapter 1 verse 2 says, In hope of eternal life, which God, who can not lie, promised before the world began. We have to trust in God's promises. Number three. Next one, John. We need to go blank. Welcome. <laughs> I'll give it to you. We need to trust in God's plan. We need to trust in God's plan. And uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, 11, um, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God's plans are right. And we need to trust in God's plans and God's purposes. And again, we go back to the three Hebrew boys back in Daniel. How could they stand there and know that they might die and go through with it, not bow? Because they trusted God's plan. God sent them there. God saved them. God sent them there. God gave them positions of authority. And he said, God, it's your plan. We're trusting you. The same way with Daniel. When Daniel was asked to eat the king's food off the king's table, and it went against everything that his principles and, and that he had been taught. And he says, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I can't do that. But if you'll just give me a chance, let me show you that God's plan's best. And by the time that the test was up, everybody was on the diet that God wanted them to have on. So we have to trust that God's plans and purposes um, are right. If you don't do that, if you doubt his person, his promises, and his plan, then, folks, you're constantly going to be bombarded and you're going to be whooped. There's no shield of faith. Okay, next. Warning, 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 danger, danger. Don't trust your feelings. I had a man come to me years ago in a church that I pastored. He said, I just want you to know that I'm divorcing my wife. I said, why? Because I've met somebody else. I said, why? Oh, but we're in love. It just, what? Feels right. 
I said, well, let me tell you something. Your heart is deceiving you because you're going against what Scripture says. Danger, danger, danger. But this is the way so many people live. They live by what feels right. It just feels right. Well, listen, you don't go by what feels right. You go by faith in what God says. Our faith should lead the way, not our emotions. The shield of faith protects us even in the most dangerous of places. Last one, please. God's word. Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Psalms 119, 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You want to grow your faith? Here it is right here. But let me just warn you. You start feeding your faith and guess what's going to happen? The enemy's going to come get you, try to have to get you. He's going to see if it's any good or not. You're going to be tested. But again, hold up the shield of faith. You trust God's person, his quality, his character, his word, His truth, his promises. Trust him. You stand on it. That's why the song that we sing, standing on the promises of Christ my Lord. We stand in what God says, and we will quench the, the darts of the devil, and we can be victorious. We can stand. That's what it's all about, right? Having done all to stand, stand therefore, and you put on the armor. All right, questions. I hope those have been helpful to you. And anybody have a question tonight? We actually got done on time. Wow. Okay, nothing? I don't have a question, but I do want to say something. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's the right answer. That's the right question. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And that's what makes God personal is when you go through those things and you stand strong in him and uh, it becomes more than words on a page. It becomes your story of God's power, God's person, God's promises in your life. It's one thing for a preacher to stand up and tell you about him. It's another thing when you claim him and walk in him and stand in him and you see God take you through all kinds of circumstances and situations and you come out on the other side and you come out victorious. Uh, God's there and this is real stuff. This isn't just theory. This works, but you gotta use it. All right, anybody else have something to share? That's great, thank you. All right, let's bow our heads and we'll be dismissed in prayer then. Thank you for being here tonight. Lord, thank you for your word. It sounds like sometimes I'm sure that we just beat that drum and beat that drum and beat that drum and beat that drum, but there's a reason. We need to study your word that we might be fully and thoroughly equipped as a workman of God, a soldier of God, a servant of God. Your word has the answer. It is that thing that you have ordained to equip us to live the Christian life, to serve you, to be victorious in battle, to strengthen our faith, to attach our hope to. And thank you for it. Thank you that it gives us instructions. Thank you that it helps us to defeat the enemy. Thank you, Lord, that it clears up our wrong thinking. Thank you for being here tonight and by your spirit helping us to learn. We pray your blessings as we go in Jesus' name. Amen.